Uh, welcome to the uh, Chiari Srinkamaya Foundation meeting. And I should mention that uh, we have met every three months now for the last uh, five or six years. So this is uh, really an amazing uh, performance. And we've managed to get first-rate speakers. And today is no exception. Um, I'd like to introduce Pavel Klein, uh, who um, um, uh, trained at uh, Oxford, where he took his baccalaureate in arts and then a master's in neuroscience, and then went to Cambridge for his bachelor's in surgery and his uh, uh, medical degree. He then went to the University of Virginia for his fellowship, uh, for his residency and fellowship in neurology and then up to Harvard where he trained in epilepsy sleep and neuroendocrinology. He was then recruited to Georgetown uh, when I was there from uh, 1999 to 2003 when he ran the epilepsy program and also the neuroendocrinology unit as well as director of the electrophysiology laboratory there. And um, I think he's um, one of the clearly and definitely one of the most intelligent uh, neurologists and men I know. And I asked him to speak in the Cambridge style, which, which is uh, without slides. <laughs> uh, and I think it gets very boring looking at pictures all the time. Um, the, uh, so Pavel went into private practice uh, in 2003. He's now out in Rockville. And his primary uh, focus of interest is epilepsy. He's done a lot of uh, research on the influence of hormones on traumatic epilepsy and prevention of epilepsy, and also cancer work, and the effect of dieting and you know various nutrition on on uh, neuronal um, um, injury. So uh, let me introduce then Pavel Klein. Thank you very much for uh, having me here, Frazier. I don't know whether I should thank or scold you for the introduction. I have no <laughs> way to live up to it, so uh, thank you all the same. Um, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, it's a cold bit tonight, and I appreciate you all being here. Uh, as uh, Frazier said, uh, he asked me to talk about epilepsy seizures. Uh, and I'll take a broad brush approach and therefore do it without slides. Uh, we're a small audience here, although I understand that we're beaming out to thousands out in the white community. What I'd like to do is uh, ask you all to ask questions so that we make it interactive and more fun. I'm going to go over the broad landscape of epilepsy and seizures. Please interrupt me at any point uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll enjoy the interaction. So uh, epilepsy is one of the common neurological disorders. Uh, it affects roughly one half to one percent of the population in the US and in the world uh, at large. Uh, it's probably similarly uh, prevalent in the developed and developing world, maybe a little more so in the developing world because of the infections. Uh, the change, the uh, prevalence and incidence of epilepsy has not changed much over the years. Uh, the uh, etiology of epilepsy is very, very varied, uh, and it falls into two broad categories, uh, or I should say uh, three categories, genetically predisposed, and over the last maybe uh, 15 to 20 years, we've had a wealth of knowledge about genetic causes of uh, epilepsy, including a slew of uh, discoveries of monogenic causes of epilepsy. Uh, acquired epilepsy, where you develop epilepsy as a result of some form of an insult that happens in life. It can be, for instance, perinatal trauma, hemorrhage. It can be infection uh, during childhood, meningeal meningoencephalitis. It can be trauma, uh, head trauma and brain injury. It can be tumor. It can be stroke. Uh, it can be vascular abnormalities of the brain. A large number of different things that can impact on the brain and cause it to be uh, uh, remodeled, if you like, uh, can result in epilepsy, either as a consequence of the remodeling or uh, as a uh, primary uh, uh, event. Um, and then you have a large group of patients whose epilepsy is what well, used to be called cryptogenic. Uh, crypto is, uh, I believe, Latin unknown, uh, so unknown cause. 
and that needs to, be, needs to make up about half of patients with epilepsy. It's shrinking a little bit, primarily because of the discovery of the genetic causes, but it still is not much less than half of the patients in whom we do not find the cause. Uh, epilepsy is a dis disorder, disorder of the brain. It's a disorder of neuronal functioning. Uh, the neurons act, as you all know, by using units of electrical activity called, called action potentials. Uh, they act in concert through networks of neurons. Uh, but that concert is not all synchronous. A seizure happens when a large number of neurons that would normally not fire together, not create these action potentials together, go and do so. So it's uh, like a large number of switches turning on at the same time. Uh, if you think of uh, Washington uh, uh, at uh, sunset or Washington at dusk, you'll see a light coming on in this building, then another light coming on in that building, a light somewhere else, and gradually these lights come on one at a time, which is pretty much how uh, different parts of the brain work. They work sort of stochastically. Uh, a seizure is like all the lights in DC coming on at the same time. Somebody's flipped the switch and everything happens at the same time. What happens if you, if you do that? What do you get, uh, you probably get uh, blow the fuse. Uh, and in a simplistic way, you can think of seizure that, uh, as being that. All the uh, neurons start firing uh, together in the part of the uh, brain that's affected by it, and as a result, you've got a dysfunction, but also altered function, which uh, makes epilepsy very interesting. Uh, the uh, uh, the physiology is linked to the chemistry. So in neurons and in the brain, there's always a balance between activity that causes action, increased activity of neurons, balanced by activity of neurons that blocks that action. It's go, no go, stop, go, yin, yang uh, paradigm. Uh, that is done by communication between neurons where we're using chemicals that either turn the neuron on or block it from being turned on. Uh, there is a large number of these chemicals and the chemicals that do the communicating between <coughs> neurons are called neurotransmitters. They're released by one neuron, go into the space that separates neurons, called the synapse, and then dock at the next neuron and then cause the change in the electric electrical activity that will either make the, make the next neuron fire or be resistant to firing. Uh, two most commonly used chemicals uh, that are used by the brain are one called GABA, which is an amino acid that does uh, blocking of uh, electrical activity in neurons, and one called glutamate, which is an amino acid that increases electrical activity of neurons. And the general thought about uh, neurochemistry and pathophysiology uh, behind seizures is that there is an imbalance between the excitation of neurons and inhibition of neurons, number one. And number two, that more neurons act together in synchrony that is normally, than is normally the case. So you've got one, increased excitability of neurons because of imbalance of the excitation inhibition, and two, increased yoking of neurons to work together in concert in synchrony. Uh, the uh, chemical imbalance uh, is a little akin to what happens in movement disorders. But in, in some of the movement disorders in dystonia, uh, and uh, for that matter for, uh, in Parkinson's disease, you've got change in neuronal activity in such a way that certain types of neurons in certain structures of the brain predominate and cause dysregulation of the muscle tone. And in a way, seizures acting in different parts of the brain uh, are similar but much more short-lived. So in dystonia, uh, you've got that imbalance and that uh, change in the motor activity for a long, long period of time. It's chronic. In seizures, it is episodic uh, for the most part. So you've got the, uh, you've got the, uh, the neurons going far together briefly and then go back to their functioning, uh, normal functioning for a while and then it may happen again.
so uh, that's sort of the uh, background uh, of epilepsy. Uh, I think the int greatest interest to everybody uh, uh, who is a patient is how does it uh, affect me, uh, what does it look like, uh, uh, what can I do with it, or what can I do about it. So I'll now go and talk a little bit about the different types of seizures and different types of epilepsy. Broadly speaking, epilepsies are divided into two categories. Those that affect the whole brain at once, and those would be called primary generalized epilepsy, because the whole brain is involved from the very beginning. And those that may start in one part of the brain, the right front or the left back or the right temple or the left temple, and may stay there or may spread. And those are, those are called focal or partial or localization related uh, epilepsies. Uh, and the symptoms of the two groups of epilepsies, the primary generalized and the, uh, and the uh, localization related, uh, differ. And the symptoms particularly of the uh, localization related epilepsy are very much dependent on the part of the brain that is affected. So if we, with the primary generalized epilepsy, you've got several types of seizures. Uh, that affect the span of the uh, of the life. Uh, four main kinds of seizures. So this is one type. It's called absent seizure. Brief interruption of consciousness, three, ten, fifteen seconds, followed by immediate resumption of activity. Uh, so you would say, well, what's the big deal? This doesn't affect anything. Why uh, why do you bother about it? Uh, while the activity is brief, it does interrupt functioning. Uh, this type of epilepsy, which is called absence, as in absence in French, uh, affects children primarily. It starts usually in the first or the second decade. Um, and it may have great impact on performance. So you can, you can imagine that if you have this sort of thing several times an hour, the child may not be attending at school. And indeed, that is the, uh, frequently the case. So I had uh, one patient not so long ago, referred uh, by one of your colleagues here in Greenbelt, a 14-year-old uh, girl who's failing her grades. She's a, uh, she is a hard-working girl. She uh, does her homework to the best of her abilities. She is well-motivated, and yet she's failing her grades. And nobody knows why. And it turns out that this is the kind of seizure that she has. And when you look at her EEG, the EEGs of these seizures are very uh, typical. They show discharges of neurons that manifest themselves as what's called spike and then wave. So instead of having the gradual uh, fluctuation in harmonious electrical activity that you uh, that is the normal electrophysiological activity that we see with EEG in patients uh, who don't have epilepsy, in these patients with absent seizures from primary children, you see uh, spike and wave spike and wave, and not the normal harmonious fluctuation. And that spike and wave interrupts consciousness, and that girl that I was seeing in the office wasn't taking in half of her lessons, and when she was doing the homework, half the time she was staring at the book and not knowing well, what's in it, mm -hmm. even though these spells, spells are brief. So uh, that's sort of one extreme version of that of, uh, form of seizures, the upsound seizures, uh, oftentimes maybe more benign than that, uh, but it does interrupt your consciousness. It's an, ep uh, it's an uh, epilepsy of primary childhood and uh, adolescence, and for reasons that's really very, very interesting and totally unknown, uh, about three quarters of these children outgrow the seizures, usually in puberty. Puberty is a very interesting part of life uh, when uh, the wiring of uh, the brain gets changed. He, uh, uh, there's a lot of pruning uh, of connections that have been made early in life, both pre-birth and post-birth, uh, and you sort of uh, chisel uh, the brain into the final form that you're going to carry with you from the age of, uh, let's say, 20 to the age of, uh, to, to, uh, you start losing uh, neurons with uh, age. Um, and in some way that we do not at all understand, uh, that uh, period affects diseases, oftentimes neurological diseases, uh, including epilepsy. And the absence seizures remit, which is to mean go away spontaneously in about th three quarters of patients during this time. Uh, another type of primary generalized epilepsy is this sort of thing, called myoclonic, myoclonic from Latin, my myo, muscle, clon uh, clonus, uh, 
movement. These are abrupt movements that may be just like I showed you. Uh, they uh, may affect anybody, but there's different types of these seizures. And one relatively common one is called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, meaning epilepsy of the youth affecting these rapid jerks. Um, this too is an epilepsy that may be relatively benign, but may also be quite bad. It too affects the whole brain from the word go. It too has its own EEG signature, which is uh, fairly pathognomonic, if, uh, unique for that uh, kind of seizures. It too often starts early on in life, uh, usually in the second decade of life, and it's relatively common. Um, it may be by itself, or it may be associated with other seizures of primary generalized epilepsy. Uh, oftentimes, patients may have these jerks, particularly in the morning, when they transition from sleep to uh, wakefulness, or indeed when they go the other way. And it's another interesting thing about epilepsy, that it is affected by the sleep-wake cycle, uh, and many seizures are more likely to happen both during sleep, disproportionately so, if you spend one third of uh, your uh, hours in sleep, seizures happen probably uh, in about, uh, about 50% of seizures may happen during sleep. So it's disproportionately more in sleep. And then particularly during, so with some, uh, with some seizures and some epilepsies, particularly the primary genus epilepsies, during the transition from sleep to wakefulness. There's something in the change in the inhibition excitation balance of the neural networks that facilitates the occurrence of seizures during this transition phase. So in this myoclonic epilepsy, you're more likely to have it uh, early in the morning, and sometimes it may cascade so that uh, the, sh the jerks become worse and worse and worse, and they can be so prominent that somebody may just fling their toothbrush uh, at, the, at the mirror in the bathroom, it is, or uh, their cup of coffee across the room. So it can be quite violent. With retention of consciousness, and that's often confusing for, uh, for uh, us physicians who tend to associate seizures with loss of consciousness. Uh, but sometimes these jerks may escalate and then result in the generalized uh, tonic clonic seizures. Uh, my first week as a medical student uh, in Cambridge, I had, uh, we, we went to lectures and uh, there was a wonderful neurologist who was gray-haired, every inch a gentleman spoke slowly and very clearly and all of a sudden he was on the floor jerking like crazy and we were all going wild so what do we do you know we've been in medicine for four days and uh here is a, a great teacher uh in the middle of a convulsion on the floor and he did this for about a minute he was very unnerving and at the end of it he stood up uh so i can't do that uh, so uh, he was demonstrating generalized convulsion, uh, uh, which I don't think I can do. Uh, I heard Frazier's really good. <laughs> uh, so generalized convulsion, uh, that's an, another type of primary generalized epilepsy. You've got convulsion that may start locally or, and then increase, 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 and you may uh, have it with, uh, with legs also. Uh, and for you will be un uh, unresponsive uh, during it, uh, maybe on the floor, may have clenching of the jaws, may have, may have foaming of the mouth, may have respiratory uh, depression and cyanosis. Uh, often very, very scary. Uh, subsides spontaneously usually within uh, a half a minute to two minutes. Uh, with often prolonged post drowsiness, uh, sleepiness, confusion. A sister version of that uh, convulsive uh, seizures is tonic seizures. And there you may have different, uh, different types of increased tone, just like you do with dystonia, uh, but it's, uh, in, this, uh, in the generalized tonic seizures, it's more generalized. So what you might have is this, arching of the back, arching of the neck, extension of the legs, extension of the fingers, extension, uh, extension of the uh, feet and, uh, and uh, plant flexion of the toes, all very, very stiff. People, uh, patients are rigid as a board. Uh, and then sometimes you may have the two combined, relatively commonly, and uh, you may start with a tonic seizure and then go from that to this sort of thing. Uh, so the tonic may issue into the tonic. 
The tonic seizure is also extremely wor uh, worrisome for somebody who's watching it, uh, particularly a family member. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got the patient unconscious, stiff as a body, and it looks like they're gonna snap. The amount of strength that goes into that hypertonic uh, situation is phenomenal. Uh, if uh, the, you've, you've had situations where people go into the seizure uh, the, in a situation where somebody wants to stop them, let us say it's uh, a scene of crime and policemen may be thinking that something bad's happening, and you, you can have four strong men trying to prevent a small woman from doing this, and they fail. Uh, the, the amount of strength that goes into it is just phenomenal. Uh, so these are generalized tonic-clonic seizures. They often happen without a warning, usually without a warning, sometimes maybe uttered by a <gasps> cry, uh, followed by uh, respiratory arrest or, or depression and then the tonic activity. Uh, there may be tongue biting, there may be loss of uh, continence, both uh, of urine, which is more common, and of feces, which is less common. Like I said, the duration is usually per half a minute to two minutes, uh, but it may be followed by prolonged post sickle confusion and uh, drowsiness. Generally speaking, talk of duration of seizures, uh, there is a golden rule that most seizures stop within two minutes, a couple of minutes meaning two. About 90% of them do. So for people who are concerned about their family members or patients themselves, uh, and they ask, should I go to the emergency room every time I have a seizure? Uh, the answer is that if you've got a no regular seizure that's relatively, uh, that, that's within these two minutes, you don't need to. About 10% of seizures may last longer than those two minutes. And in that case, you've got a 90% likelihood of the seizure becoming prolonged and possibly going into something that's called status epilepticus, which is a very long uh, continuation of seizures, much longer than these two minutes, maybe uh, 30 minutes, maybe longer. And it is associated with high possibility of brain injury, poor outcome, including sometimes death. So if you've got seizure that lasts longer than two uh, or three minutes, you should go to the uh, hospital, the emergency room, uh, to make sure that you're in a safe environment where they can stop the seizure. So these are the primary generalized epilepsies. Um, and they are, uh, again, of two broad categories. One are the genetic causes uh, that do not affect other aspects of brain functioning. Uh, and these occur in otherwise healthy individuals uh, who may have these seizures but otherwise develop normally uh, and have a normal life. Uh, there have been a number of genes identified with, uh, with uh, these seizures, uh, the n number of uh, single gene mutations uh, that uh, affect different aspects of uh, neuro neuronal uh, firing and neuronal transmission is now very large indeed. Um, and then you may have a a uh, small group of patients who have these generalized seizures that have them in the context of overall brain damage. Some of these may also be familiar about genetics, some of them may be, uh, um, be non-genetic due to, for instance, prenatal injury. Uh, a, an example that you can think of is uh, uh, a child with, uh, who had a rubella infection uh, in, ut in utero uh, <coughs> They, they, uh, that infection has damaged the brain severely, that child develops very poorly, uh, and as part of that, he may or she may have uh, th these generalized seizures of different kinds. Uh, the treatment for the primary generalized epilepsy is usually uh, uh, such that patients respond well to medications. Um, about uh, probably 80% 80, 80 of patients treat but with primary generalized epilepsy that's not due to an underlying bad brain process. Uh, respond to uh, medications in such a way that they're seizure free, take the medications and go and uh, go by that normal life. About maybe 20% give or take of patients have uh, what's called refractory epilepsy, the primary generalized epilepsy, and refractory means not responsive to medications. And then it may be uh, a challenge to find treatment and you may uh, use different drugs uh, different approaches. So those are the uh, primary generalized epilepsies. The uh, localization-related epilepsy uh, 
has seizures that are divided into, again, two broad categories. Those that affect consciousness, and those are called partial complex seizures, and those that do not affect consciousness, and those are called partial simple seizures. That's sort of uh, a nomenclature that's in the process of being changed. We physicians, when we get something right, like everybody else, get bored, and so we start thinking about it, and then we come up with things that make it more complicated and less easy to understand. And that's what we've done with epilepsy classification in the last five years. So, uh, we, instead of having two categories, now we have 15, and nobody can remember them, and, and those people who saw them up are really happy because they have a role in life. <laughs> so, using the old uh, nomenclature, we've got partial simple and partial complex seizures. Um, and those seizures, the, the, the focal seizures are very, very interesting because they do affect only one part of the brain and the symptomic manifestation reflects the function of that brain, of that part of the brain. So you can have seizures that are due to the activity of the left frontal cortex uh, down here in the area that affects the thumb causing continuous seizure but no, uh, with movement of the thumb and nothing else. Uh, and if it goes on for long enough, if it's like status epilepticus, it's called uh, epilepsia partialis continua, uh, partial epilepsia that continues. Or you may have something similar, but instead of twitching, I may have a burning sensation of the thumb or uh, numbness of the thumb. And then the seizures also on the, bar, or on, on the left side of the brain, but in the parietal lobe. Uh, or, I may start seeing stars uh, and uh, strange visual hallucinations if I have seizures coming from the occipital lobe. Uh, the commonest site for focal seizures is the temporal lobe. And you may have diverse uh, symptoms, and some of them indeed make it difficult to tell whether the patient is having seizures or not. So you may have typically uh, hallucinations of smell. You may smell something, usually something unpleasant. Uh, sometimes patients can't describe it. Uh, it may be like burning rubber or rancid butter, unpleasant stuff that is not there. Uh, and that may be all, or that may be the beginning of uh, spread of the seizure with other symptoms. Uh, when you have those seizures, they're called uncinate seizures. You have the involvement of uh, part of the uh, temporal lobe that's on the inside of the temporal lobe uh, and involves the uh, hipp hippocampus uh, part of it that's called the hook uh, or ancus. You may have uh, hallucinations of taste. Uh, you may have a funny feeling, something strange in your abdomen, rising out of the chest and into the neck, and you can't really put your finger on it, but it's something not fun. Uh, and you may have, uh, and that's because of involvement of the autonomic nervous system in the part of the temple lobe that's involved. With the autonomic nervous system, which is relatively commonly involved with the temple lobe seizures, you may have sweating, you may have palpitations, you may have pallor, you may have sudden urge to defecate or to urinate. All of that is part of the seizure. You may have a sensation that the world is spinning around you. These are all uh, sensory or autonomic symptoms. You may also have emotional symptoms. Relatively commonly in patients with temporal seizures, you'll have fear. The child suddenly, for reason, no reason at all, gets scared and clutches at mom, mom's clothes. No reason at all. Eyes go wide, child's pale. Anxiety is copper and fear and anxiety are common manifestations of seizures as is panic attack. And it can be very difficult to distinguish those from psychiatric disease sometimes, uh, because you get fear and anxiety and depression uh, with psychiatric diseases, and you may have them episodically with, uh, uh, with seizures. You may have what's called nesic symptoms, where you have disturbance of thinking and memory. With memory, you may commonly have something called Deja vu, which is French for having seen or, uh, already. And you have a situation where you're looking at uh, a totally new building and you are sure all of a sudden that you've seen it before and you know that you've been in the situation before, you can't know why, but you know you've been there before. And you haven't. Very interesting. Something in the, in the brain sort of making a misconnection switch 
and you have a feeling that you've experienced this before. You've got a false intonation of a memory that, of an event that hasn't happened before. You may have the very opposite of that, uh, something called jamais vu, never having been seen before. Uh, and you have a situation where you're looking at somebody that you've been with uh, for a long time and suddenly uh, you don't know who they are. Or uh, you're in a situation where, let's, uh, where you're in uh, relatively frequently and suddenly uh, you uh, feel like you've never been here before. And those are all disturbances of uh, memory uh, switches, if you like. Uh, you may also have a disturbance of cognition. You may, be, you may have trouble with speech. Uh, if, you, if you've got a uh, seizure affecting the speech areas, you may have trouble understanding speech or, uh, or speaking. And you may have the disturbance of uh, awareness of space. Everything may look very big or, or very small. Everything, but you may have a sensation that you don't belong to yourself, that you're floating above yourself. And in patients with temporal lobe seizures, all these things sometimes come together. And it's a really interesting <coughs> phenomenon. They, when they come together, the experience is not unlike that of taking uh, recreational drugs that, uh, side of that are psychoactive. LSD is a very good example of a uh, temporal lobe seizure. Uh, you have very similar symptoms. Uh, and the reason, presumably, is because during the seizure, the brain does something that it very rarely do, does when it's under active control of uh, the conscious uh, parts of the brain. Uh, and somehow that un, uh, unusual activity sort of draws open the window on the, uh, on, uh, the brain's activity. So those are, uh, those are focal seizures. Uh, they may stay focal. Uh, and if they stay focal without loss of consciousness, they're, uh, they're simple seizures. If they uh, are focal and you have loss of consciousness, they uh, are uh, partial complex seizures. Or they may then go on to become generalized tonic-clonic seizures like I described before, which and they're, they're called then secondarily generalized uh, tonic-clonic seizures. And that happens because the seizure activity spreads from that one part of the brain to the rest of the brain. Typically after focal seizures, uh, you may feel tired afterwards and you may feel sleepy afterwards. You may sometimes have a headache afterwards. Like the primary generalized seizures, the focal seizures usually don't last that long, usually a minute or two. That minute or two is an eternity to uh, somebody who's watching somebody go, go through the seizure. It, it, it has no end, yeah. Um, so, uh, so much for the description of the seizures. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Oh, uh how do you counsel people about the, um, the dissonance sometimes between the seizure uh, phenomenon that you're observing and the EEG? Um, I, one of my teachers used to say, treat the patient, not the EEG tracing. And I don't know if that thinking has evolved or it's been affected by some of the newer understandings. Uh, that's a very good question. So the question is, well, what do you do if the patient has, for instance, no symptoms and has an abnormal EEG, or the patient has symptoms and has a normal EEG? Is that, yeah. Uh, so, uh, patients often will have the symptoms and the EEG may be normal. Uh, why is that? The EEG picks up changes in electrical activity of the brain that are very, very small. The brain is a gigantic network of electrical activity, but each part of that electrical activity is very small. And we are recording it with crude electrical de measurement devices on the skin for the most part. What happens to the electrical signal? Uh, let's say that it's coming from the very surface of, uh, of uh, my left frontal lobe when I was doing this. Uh, that signal, you've got, a, uh, let's say, uh, a billion of neurons were, were firing together. Uh, to c c cause a seizure, and that generates a, a large pool of electrical activity that is propagated up uh, to the skull through the layer of uh, uh, wrapping that uh, protects the brain, uh, the, med the, the, the med meningeal uh, layers, through the fluid that surrounds the brain, through the skull, through the muscle, through the fat, through the skin. All these layers <coughs> filter out the electrical signal, signal so that by the time it reaches the skin, it's tiny, 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 and we then amplify it. 
Well, let's say that that seizure is not at the surface of, the, of my brain, but very deep inside. And let's say that it's not as huge an area of the brain as it was before that's involved, but it's much smaller area. And let's say that the signal is much smaller. So it has to get to the surface of the brain and then it's filtered out. And it may happen that it, the, the signal is small enough so that the, it's totally filtered out and we do not see it at the surface. So that's a situation where you may have patient with clinical manifestations of seizures and no EEG abnormality. And indeed, it is pretty common when we patient, take patients with horrible seizures and we are that we're looking to see whether they might be treated first surgically. We take them into an epilepsy monitoring unit, we stop their medication and we uh, record their EEG and uh, video their seizures to put the two and two together to see whether they have seizures coming from part of the brain that could be surgically resected. These are patients that have not responded to medications. And very commonly, you'll have a situation where the patient's clinical seizure starts and the electrographic abnormality starts 10 or 20 seconds later. Um, and you may have the opposite. Uh, you, you may have the electrical seizure start and then the clinical abnormality starts later. Why would that be? Let's say that the electrical activ activity starts in part of the brain that doesn't cause any clinical abnormalities. Uh, and then takes a while to spread to parts of the brain that do cause clinical abnormalities. So you may then have a situation where you've got uh, abnormal EEG without clinical abnormalities and then clinical manifestations. So those are extreme cases that we see but when we do the recording of patients with seizures. But in the uh, at home, you may have a situation where you may have those uh, the symptoms of seizures. You come to uh, the outpatient office, you have an EEG and the EEG is normal. And that happens relatively commonly. And uh, we now sort of try to get around it by doing the EEG recording for a longer period of time. About a third of patients who have uh, seizure epilepsy may have normal, regular EEG. Uh, that, uh, that, that figure goes down. If you do the EEG repeatedly, it may go down to about 15% if you do it maybe six times. Well, if you do the long recording for, let's say, a day or two, uh, and do the recording during sleep uh, and for a prolonged period of time, you will have fewer patients who have normal EEG. Uh, let's say those 15%, but you still may have that. So you're absolutely right. You treat the patient, not the EEG. At the other end, you may have patients who don't have seizures, who have abnormal EEG. So for those patients with primary generalized epilepsy that I, that I uh, described early on, if you take a mother or sister of that girl who was having a hard time at school with her ups and seizures and the mother doesn't have any seizures and the sister hasn't had any seizure and you uh, do an EEG on them for uh, those 24 hours there's roughly a 20% chance of that EEG being abnormal in first degree family relatives of patients with uh, primary genitalized epilepsy such as, such as this. In the population at large if you take uh, 100 people who have no symptoms of epilepsy at all there is a possibility that one out of those 100 will have an abnormal EEG. Uh, no, uh, no neurological disease, no reason to have seizures. One out of the 100 may have an abnormal EEG that might be suggestive of epilepsy. So again, you have, you're right, you treat the patient, not uh, the EEG. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. When you um, see a focal seizure, do you see an evolution in those from children to adulthood? In other words, if I had episodes of deja vu as a child and as an adult, I move into the uh, being able to smell things that are not there or the sweating. Um, is that is that like a normal course of the way right. things take place? And then the second component is I was wondering if you could address uh, the sleep component if you have central apneas uh, versus the other type of apnea and have, does that play a role in the seizure? Yeah, those are two great questions. So let me take the uh, thank you. Let me take the first question. Uh, so can seizures evolve? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so with primary generalized epilepsy, usually you have what you'll get at the, uh, from the beginning. 
Uh, and there's a group of primary genetic epilepsies that may remit uh, during adolescence, as I mentioned before. With focal uh, seizures, but that's usually different. There are focal seizures that also are benign, so-called uh, benign epilepsies of childhood, that may also, like those absent seizures, remit uh, in adolescence. Uh, but for the most part, uh, focal seizures uh, don't follow that pattern. Uh, and they may uh, follow a number of different paths. Let's take an example. Uh, I've had a car accident, uh, I've hit my head, I've bled into my left front lobe. Uh, Dr. B B Henderson's taken out the, uh, the blood clot from me and a year later I developed seizures. Um, why have I developed seizures? I have developed seizures because uh, the part of the brain that was damaged by the blood and the trauma has reorganized itself and part of the reorganization has been increase of the uh, connection across the board of the neurons uh, to make them uh, more interconnected and work together in, in synchrony than they did before and part of it may be compensation in increased excitation. So that's something that's happened to the brain already that's just, uh, resulted in seizures. And the Creole question is then does it stop there or does it evolve? Uh, and it can do both. So if I'm lucky uh, I will start taking medications and I will respond to the medications and I will not have any more seizures and it will stay there. If I'm unlucky, uh, that first seizure uh, will then give rise to more seizures down the road and the symptoms may stay the same or they may change. Uh, because the part of the brain that was initially involved may itself change or it may affect other parts of the brain that may also change and be recruited into the seizure territory. Uh, and that may happen with uh, more with some instances than with others. Post-traumatic epilepsy is a good example of uh, when things may evolve uh, and, uh, and get progressively worse. Uh, there is a uh, saying that was uh, coined by a prominent uh, British neurologist at the turn of the uh, 19th century uh, that uh, Seizures beget seizures, uh, whereby it is thought that the seizure activity itself is like an injury and will cause the brain around it uh, to respond, and that response may result in either alteration of the seizures or worsening of the seizures or more seizures. And it's, uh, so you may start with a smell, and then you might indeed have the seizure spread to part of the brain that controls uh, balance and you may have vertigo or that controls by the autonomic nervous system and you may have uh, a sweating and, uh, and uh, heart racing and sometimes it happens that you, you get spread of the symptoms and spread of the uh, area that involves, involves seizures sometimes you may just migrate so you may sometimes lose that uh, of uh, smell hallucination and develop new symptoms uh, an extreme example of this is something that, uh, that the neurosurgeons know very well. So about a third of patients with epilepsy don't respond to medications. And when they have focal epilepsy, we try to see whether uh, the focus of the epilepsy in, is in a place that could be treated surgically. Because if it is, and if you can remove that part of the brain safely, then the patient may become free of seizures and may sometimes be cured quite commonly. Well. That works for, uh, let, let's say, uh, two-thirds of patients with a temporal lobe seizure. But something strange happens in some patients. And that strange thing is that three or five or ten years down the road, they might have seizures again. And some of those patients may have those seizures on the opposite side of the brain. Nowhere near where they had it before. But of course, there's connection from one uh, hippocampus, uh, one temporal lobe to, uh, to the other. And in some way, there is kindling or yoking of part of the brain that was not involved in the original seizure area and becomes involved with time. So that's another way how seizures may spread. A third way to, uh, the th third part of the answer to your question is the following. The part of the brain where the temporal lobe is happening may, or where the seizure is happening, partly may with time get damaged. And this is most particularly prominent for uh, temporal seizures and most particularly uh, prominent for memory. 
So I'll give you an, uh, an example. Uh, a young woman that I've been seeing now for 15 years developed seizures uh, in her uh, second decade uh, at the time of her menarche. She's now in her early 40s for no good reason at all. Uh, and the seizures were uh, initially not that frequent and then became more frequent, just like uh, we discussed now. They, uh, she sort of conditioned that part of the brain or the seizures conditioned uh, that part of the brain to having more and more seizures. And then she started not responding to medications. Uh, and the seizures came from one temporal lobe, and they were potentially uh, treatable with, seizure, uh, with surgery. So we went through the surgical, uh, pre-surgical workup, and she had a young child, and she, uh, as some patients do, decided not to do the surgery because she was scared, as people are, uh, of the risk of doing it. This was six years ago. Um, now, uh, she has trouble with memory. Now she would like to have this uh, surgery done. And now both temporal lobes are seizing. Mm. So it can evolve and it can have consequence both on the seizures themselves and on the part of the brain that uh, is affected by the seizures. So that's the, the first question. I'm sorry it took so long to answer it. Uh, the, uh, the second question is about apnea and, uh, uh, and seizures. And, and sleep, sleep and seizures in general, apnea and seizures uh, in particular. They're, they're both very, very interesting. Uh, I don't want to uh, make anybody go to sleep with this, so I'll try to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, seizures are more likely to happen uh, at night, like I, like I said, for reasons that we don't really understand. There's two possible uh, explanations. One is electrophysiological. That there's something in the way the uh, sleep regulates the uh, functioning of the brain that makes it more prone to have seizures. And uh, indeed, when you go to sleep, the uh, EEG changes in such a way that it becomes much more rhythmic and slower. So that rhythmicity maybe allows uh, the seizures to come through. Um, uh, the, the rhythmic, the rhythmicity, the slow rhythmicity allows uh, the seizures to come through. Um, the second aspect may be hormonal. So there's pretty profound changes in hormones during sleep uh, and the, uh, the uh, diurnal rhythm. Uh, so at midnight you have lows, lows of, cort uh, of cortisol uh, that become then high at 8 a.m. And with it, temperature changes, uh, lows at midnight, highs in the morning, and a bunch of other things change. Seizures are sensitive to fever. Seizures are sensitive to hormones, including steroids, including adrenal steroids, including gonadal, so gonadal steroids that fluctuate. And it is possible that part of the, uh, part of the uh, change in seizure manifestation with sleep may just uh, be coincidental with the hormonal changes, uh, but we don't quite know that. Now, apnea uh, is a separate topic. So, apnea and seizures coexist more commonly than you think, uh, than would happen by pure chance. Apnea, of course, is very common. Uh, it's about 10% of men, about 5% of women who are premenopausal, and then after menopause, the ratio equal, uh, equalizes. Uh, and uh, apnea, uh, is more common in patients with epilepsy and patients with epilepsy are more likely to have apnea. So how do, how do the two relate? If you have apnea, uh, what happens? Uh, apnea is Greek for no breathing. Uh, and what happens is that at night, <sighs> you may have breathing pattern, which as I showed now, is ob obstructive. You Make the effort to breathe, but the air doesn't go into the lungs because the airway collapses. It's called obstructive sleep apnea. When that happens, well, what's the consequence? The consequence of that is that the blood oxygen goes, goes low. Low blood oxygen makes you more likely to have seizures, and indeed apneas can trigger seizures in patients with seizures. So uh, patients who have epilepsy and apnea are more likely to have the seizures poorly controlled if the apnea is not controlled. Um, the seizures can uh, give rise to the apnea, uh, but that's probably less common. Uh, the commonest form of that would be the generalized sonic clonic seizures with cessation of breathing. Uh, however, after a seizure, there is commonly prolonged respiratory depression, meaning the breathing is shallow or not there. Uh, and that's associated with generalized quiescence of brain activity. 
There is a condition associated with epilepsy, uh, most commonly with bad epilepsy, called sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, SUDEP for brief, where patients, usually patients with refractory epilepsy that doesn't respond to medications, die suddenly of an unknown cause. And usually it's not during a seizure. Uh, if, you, if you die during a seizure, then you have got an explained cause. Uh, but commonly it is at night. Commonly it is the patient's lying face down. Uh, and it's unexplained. I have a patient uh, whom I lost last spring. Uh, this is a man with refractory epilepsy. Very nice uh, gentleman uh, with focal temporal obsessions uh, that were not that well controlled. And uh, part of the reason was because he wasn't taking medications. Part of the reason why he wasn't taking medications was because uh, he kept forgetting and part of it was finances. And when the Pope was visiting uh, uh, DC, his wife got up at 5 a.m., went to see the Pope. Uh, and his son went to check up on his father at 11 in the morning and found his father dead, face down in bed. Was fine the night before. We think that the, the, amongst the causes of that condition may be apnea after a seizure. So when you have the seizure and you have general uh, repression of all electrical activity of the brain, part of that repression involves neurons in the brainstem that control respiration and neurons in the brainstem that control arousal. You need both uh, to, for you to breathe. Uh, and after, it's thought that after a seizure, in some patients, these neurons, and it's a small number of clusters of neurons that use a transmitter called serotonin, uh, that have a diffuse ramification to the brain where they are involved in maintenance of arousal and uh, have projections to the uh, lungs, uh, lung muscles where they control breathing. Uh, that these neurons get knocked out as, a, as an after effect of the seizure. And as a result, the patient loses the drive to breathe. Uh, and in the extreme form of it, it may result in death. The less extreme form of it is relatively common where you see a patient go through the genital implant seizure and they stop breathing for 10, 20 seconds and they resume breathing or their breathing is short. So that's sort of apnea of seizures, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, Seizures mostly arrive in the arise in the cerebral cortex, correct? Yeah. But you mentioned some seizures arise deep down in the brain. They may spread down to the deep down in the brain. So, but the activity that gives rise to seizures, often if it's generalized seizure, will spread to the basal ganglia and the brainstem also. Can something arise in the brainstem? So uh, that's a very good question, uh, and uh, uh, the. Uh, General answer is I don't know. Uh, there is a type of seizures that uh, is well recognized that comes outside of the uh, cortical parts of the brain, and that's uh, hypothalamic seizures caused usually by a condition that uh, called uh, hypothalamic hematoma, which is a malformation of uh, uh, of the uh, of the brain affecting the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is part of the uh, the. the uh, undersurface of the brain that's involved with uh, regulation of hormonal functioning of, uh, of uh, the body. Uh, and it, it is not involved with the cortical functioning of, uh, of uh, the uh, rest of the brain. But some seizures do arise from there, uh, the hypothalamic seizures. Uh, those seizures have a, yeah. Um, as for seizures uh, arising from other parts of the brain, uh, I don't know that uh, there is any firm evidence, but it's thought of, it's, it's been suggested that the seizures may uh, arise from the, uh, from, from the nuclei of the, uh, the basal ganglia nuclei and, uh, and lower, uh, and sometimes that you may have dystonic seizures arising uh, from uh, the central pathways of the brainstem, uh, but the evidence is sort of uh, uh, mixed. And, and what's your diagnosis, uh, what's your definition of it? Dystonic seizure. <laughs> so uh, you caught me there. Uh, maybe you should answer that. No, no. It, was, it seems to be 
So dystonia and seizure spa uh, are very interesting. You can indeed have dystonic seizure, uh, dystonia that's due to seizures. So when I do this, I may have a seizure. Um, the, with seizure, this is going to be episodic. It's going to last for a finite period of time. And I'm out of my depth here, but so please correct me if I say things that are not right. But with uh, dystonic mo movement disorder, you're much more likely to have it for a prolonged period of time. Right? You may sometimes have similar, uh, similar uh, uh, dys dystonic, uh, uh, dystonic uh, movements. You may have this, which can be regular dystonia, or it can be uh, dystonic seizure. Uh, the difference here most likely will be the t duration of the uh, event, which will be short lasting in patient with seizure uh, than in patient uh, with dystonia. In patient with seizure, by and large, the dystonia will come from cortical, abnormal cortical activity. You may have situations where you've got this as a prolonged seizure, status epilepticus, uh, the epilepsy of partial is continua that I spoke about, uh, spoke about before. I have a lady who's, uh, who's got a patient who has got recurrent meningiomas uh, that have come back again and again and again. She's been operated on three times, she's had radiation twice, and she gets these dystonic seizures. Uh, and in her, it may last a long time, but by and large, that's not the case. By and large, uh, with the, if the dystonia is due to seizures, it's going to be uh, short-lasting uh, and uh, will then lead to relaxation and resumption of normal motor activity. Whereas with uh, movement disorder dystonia, it may uh, be much uh, longer. And 85% and of the time, you could make that diagnosis with an EEG? You should be able to make that diagnosis with EEG, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and also those other seizures you talked about, the gustatory and the anxiety, phobias, jamais vu, <coughs> they would all show up uh, with epileptic foresight. They may or may not, but like I, uh, we discussed before, you may have those patients uh, with normal EEG uh, for the reasons that I've uh, discussed right. uh, earlier. Uh, if you do a longer EEG, uh, you have a higher likelihood of picking something up. Uh, but you still have, will have a proportion of patients in you may have nothing. And I'll give you another example. I had a patient who had, uh, uh, who, who had uh, uh, olfactory hallucinations and autonomic manifestations part of seizures, and they were relatively frequent and didn't uh, respond to medication, and we brought him in for post-op surgical workup. That patient was in the EMU for seven days, and for seven days he didn't have a single spike, and then he started having seizures. No spikes. So if, he, if I'd done him on our, if I'd done his EEG on outpatient basis and I'd monitored him for three days, I would have seen nothing. But he did have seizures. So you still have uh, patients who may have normal EEG and, uh, and may have seizures. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, um, are they normally diagnosed as not autonomic or epileptiform by most doctors? Or right. So the, that's a sort of very, a, a very tricky area. So if you've got a patient who's got symptoms of seizures and they have normal EEG, how do you make the diagnosis whether they're real seizures or what uh, Kelly calls non-epileptic seizures? Uh, non-epileptic seizures are behavioral manifestations <coughs> that are similar to seizures without the electrical activity uh, of seizures. So they're, uh, they're psychogenic events. Um, and the standard way of distinguishing between the two is with EEG capturing an event and having a normal EEG. And most of the time, uh, that can sort of give you the diagnosis. Is it possible to make a mistake? Yes, it is. Uh, how do you know that you've made a mistake? Sometimes you don't. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are instances of uh, good epileptologists missing seizures uh, uh, and uh, good epileptologists over diagnosing seizures. But, because sometimes it is difficult to make. You know, oftentimes, you know, non-epileptic seizures will have clinical manifestations that will give the game away. And between that and the normal EG, you can be reasonably certain. Um, but sometimes you can make a mistake. Or they even term it just generalized seizure disorder versus epilepsy. Right, so uh, if, if you 
think that they're not uh, electrographic seizures. Uh, they need to call them non epileptic seizures or, psycho or psychogenic seizures. Uh, but uh, you can call them just con convulsions of uh, non unspecified. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, well, I've gone on for a long time. So, uh, yes. Oh, did Alice in Wonderland describe seizures? So, Alice in Wonderland may have described either seizures or migraines. Uh, and both may have the same manifestation. Furthermore, uh, everybody knows Alice in Wonderland, right? Mm -hmm. You go through the door and all of a sudden everything is like through the far end of the telescope. Um, and that happens as a result of malfunctioning of the occipital lobes and temporal lobes where per visual information is processed initially per, by the simple per geometric and color, per, uh, color per, uh, cues in the occipital lobe and then uh, putting it all together into uh, meaning and tying it with, mem to, with memory in the temporal lobe. Uh, and you may have malfunctioning of that such that it will give rise to uh, micropsia, seeing everything very small, or macropsia, seeing everything very large, uh, with uh, either seizures or with migraines. And it's pretty typical with, uh, with migraines. Uh, and there it's thought to be due to uh, constriction of blood vessels leading to uh, insufficient blood supply of the occipital and temporal lobes. Um, you have a condition of childhood, which uh, Alice may have had, called the uh, benign occipital epilepsy of childhood. Uh, and it's one of those uh, uh, benign epilepsies of childhood that are focal uh, and that spontaneously remit in adolescence often. And they will have symptoms just like Alice in Wonderland with the micropsia or macropsia or other visual hallucinations that may the, then issue uh, into headache and you may have, it may look just like migraine uh, and you may have an abnormal EEG and, uh, and uh, seizures. So it, it could be either migraines or seizures or both together. Yeah. Had an electroshock treatment work? Gosh, uh, so how did electroshock uh, treatment work for depression? Uh, so I'm not a psychiatrist, but what happens per electroshock is just like a seizure. You, uh, uh, everybody's seen uh, one flow of cuckoo's nest, yeah? So uh, everybody knows what the electroshock therapy uh, does. Nowadays, most of us know it only from that film uh, because it's not practiced that commonly anymore, but it is still effective. So most likely what uh, electroshock does is by the general uh, excitation of all neural networks, including networks that have a neurotransmitters whose deficiency may be associated with seizures, such as norepinephrine and uh, serotonin, those are the networks are activated together with everything else, and you may have a transient increase in those uh, in release of those neurotransmitters and resetting of those networks, and maybe that's how it works. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, modern version of electroshock therapy, and that's tri transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, whereby you take magnetic coils, uh, usually it's a coil of eight, uh, and put it on the surface of the skull, uh, and uh, when, you per, when, you per, when you activate it, it will then per, uh, it result in magnetic field going deep uh, in, inside the brain and may reach uh, to within a couple of centimeters of the surface of the brain. And you can use it for different uh, things, but one of the areas that has been uh, found to be beneficial is stimulation of part of the brain that may result in improvement in depression. And very interestingly, it is the left frontal part of the brain uh, whose stimulation results in clearance of depression with transcranial magnetic stimulation. So that's uh, there, it's presumed to be activation of the networks of the uh, frontal lobe uh, that may be depressed in depression. Do you deal with abdominal epilepsy at all? So abdominal epilepsy is very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that may be one of those very difficult uh, conditions to diagnose. Let me ask you why do you ask. Um, when my dear friend's son has it and he's, they're having a hard time right now, he's on Lamictal and they're <clears throat> trying to deal with the whole thing and he went into the hospital nothing showed up on right. any of the EGs right. 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 so right. So uh, it's a, the abdominal epilepsy is one of those focal epilepsies and uh, one that can be really difficult to diagnose. So what you may have is paroxysmal, sudden onset nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. And that's it. Uh, it's thought to be due to the autonomic nervous activation, uh, deep temporal lobe uh, and 
because it is deep in the envelope, if it doesn't spread, you may not pick it up on the EEG. So you may have a normal EEG, and that's relatively common uh, in that setting. Uh, and then you sort of treat it empirically, and sometimes it can be difficult to treat. Uh, you treat it like any other uh, focal epilepsy, but it can sometimes be difficult to treat. And it, uh, in childhood, uh, it can be, uh, the, di the differential diagnosis of that in childhood would be migraines, uh, which commonly will present with similar symptoms. He has the spells at all too, like where he can't eat. Like he just says, I, I love this food, but mom, I just can't eat it right now. Like he, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of issues, but. Interesting, yeah. Could, could bloating be a form of uh, abdominal seizure? It could. It could. So uh, with the autonomous, uh, autonomous nervous activation, you may, you may have flatulence and you may have uh, diarrhea. Not common, uh, but yes. And you could, you, you could uh, theoretically have uh, paroxysmal of heart blood. Uh, not common, but yes, possible. Well, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Klein. Um, our next talk uh, will be April 13th, Wednesday, and Michael Healy will be coming down from Providence, Rhode Island to talk about the physical therapeutic aspects. He's a doctorate in physiotherapy and osteopathy, and I think he's the most, uh, the best, one of the top guys in North America. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Klein. That was thank you. wonderful. Thank that was you. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. Thank you.